Um, so uh, maybe a quick introduction. My name is Sang Trin. Uh, this is Robin Gallipo. Uh, both of us work at Open Plus, uh, where we do Drupal stuff. And um, uh, if you are here for the five stages of web modernization, uh, you're in the right place. If you're not, uh, you're not in the right place. But I assume you're in the right place. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions just to get a feel for who I have in front of me. I have uh, a lot of lot familiar place, faces in the room. So um, who here is from uh, private industry? Is there a private industry? Yes. Uh, government. Anyone here from government? Yeah. I thought so. All right. And uh, the rest of you, public, public, Ottawa, Carlton, maybe. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That helps me. All right. And uh, last question. Who here is like about to pass out from those cookies. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, we're good. All right, good. I don't have to flip this thing right here five minutes. Um, all right, so uh, the topic that we're gonna talk about today is the five stages of web modernization. And, uh, and you know, if you, if you read the, uh, the intro to this, you will, you will recognize this slide. Um, and I want to first talk a little bit about web modernization and the difference between web modernization and maybe web renewal, which we're all kind of, we've, we've, all, the, we've all had the tried and true web renewal. So web renewal is, is I think we all kind of understand what web renewal is, right? So, so you know, you've got some content and someone's come to you and said, hey, we're doing a brand change. You got you to gotta switch this stuff. So, uh, so you know, generally it's design, it's some uh, user testing, it's some IA changes. Uh, but by and large, your content remains the same, and and you know, the goal of your web renewal is really to try to try to help people find your content better, generally, right? And you know, if that is the goal of your web project, then you know, there's a lot of technology that can help you with that. Because if your sole purpose is to try to manage that content. There's lots out there that will help you do that. And I think the challenge that we have is that can lead you down the path to, to uh, difficult technology decisions. When we talk about web modernization, on the other hand, uh, you're probably all facing this today, right? You're being asked, hey, uh, you know our website, uh, can we get that into uh, Siri? Can I ask Siri, you know, hey, uh, what are the wait times over at uh, the international gate at uh, the Ottawa airport, right? Or maybe uh, you're being asked to get your content up onto Google. And you're being asked, hey, uh, you know, what are the recalls for my car right now that are up at the Transport Canada, right? So, so it's a, it's a, even though all the steps that lead up to that state are very similar to web renewals, the fact of the matter is, is that you've got to get this data out of your CMS and into many, many different platforms. And historically, those platforms might have been mobile, right? That was, that was the first one, right? You gotta make sure it's mobile first. Um, but then nowadays, if you, if, if the, for those of you who read the, the, the keynote this morning, Adam said something really, really interesting. He talked about API first, right? Talked about the fact that Drupal can get any piece of data out of that database and make it available through a RESTful interface, right? And the other thing he said, which I love, is that Drupal can do anything. It really can do anything. It's not just a CMS. So here you are. Uh, you're, uh, you're in charge of this web modernization project, or you've been told, hey, you've got to do a web modernization project. And you're like, great. So what are we going to do? So you go through all the regular steps of a web renewal. right? You go through design. You go through IA. You go through user testing. Everything looks great. Uh, maybe you build it. Maybe somebody else builds it. But uh, you, uh, you get all this great content architecture. Um, and you know you have these content types, right? You've got a news content type, and they show you what news content type looks like. It's great. It's fielded. It's got a title. It's got a body. It's got an author. It's got a publish date. Fantastic! I can get this data out of here. And then you realize uh, you've got uh, thirty thousand pages that you got to move to that thing. And you're like, if you plan for this, fantastic, right? Uh, if you haven't planned for this, it uh, generally sounds like this. What am I going to do with all this content, right? Like, how am I going to get all this old content into this really, really awesome platform that I can then use to get stuff out to Google, to get stuff out to Siri, to get stuff out to Alexa, right? 
So this, so you know, fundamentally, this is what I see the difference between a web renewal project and a web modernization project. And this particular discussion here is around how, once you've got that, that great website up and running, how are you going to get that old content into your new website? Okay. Let's look to the next uh, So stage one, we talked about this. It's the holy shit moment, right? It's uh, I've got 30,000 pages. What am I going to do with this? And, and, and second of all, how am I going to identify all these pages, right? Because you're sitting here and you're thinking, how am I, how am I even going to know what all my stuff is? Can I look at Google? Can I look at my site map? Can I do something to get at those, at those particular pages? And so you're sitting there and you're trying to figure out how to do this. Okay, can you flip to the next thing? And in addition to that, you've got to make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to cram it into meets some sort of standard, right? This is a TBS standard, but I'm sure we're, there's a lot of federal government there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you may or may not recognize this. <laughs> But there are standards that you've got to follow, right? And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about Drupal Web. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't heard of it. But, but you know, you, you are all, your all best interest is to get your content and your build into Drupal Web because you know immediately that it's going to meet many of these standards that have been put into place by TDS. Okay, yeah, denied. All right, next slide. <laughs> okay, Rock, because, you know, we all love doing raw. There's nothing better than looking through 30,000 pages of content and figuring out what's redundant, right? Like the joy of, of web renewal. But the challenge that we know you're going to have and that we all know we have is trying to identify that content, right? So what I want to talk about is some automated ways uh, and automated tools that can help you find that content. So, you know, we've got uh, Google. Google's great. But there's no real easy way to get that search out. And Google finds some weird stuff sometimes, like slash node stuff. And you're like, well, how does Google know about that? Um, you, there are crawler tools that you can use, right? So these crawler tools are, are tools that can go and basically click every link on your website to figure out what does your website look like, right? So there's tools like Patch and Nutch, uh, Node.js, uh, there's Go Human Leads. And if you're uh, working on a Mac, I don't know how many of you at the government have Macs, but for those of you on Macs, there's Integrity Plus, which is a great little tool that runs right off your Mac, and it'll actually go and crawl your website. Okay? And the great thing about crawlers is that you now have a list of URLs that you can use as part of your ROT exercise. And what's great about this is that it, it gives you two things. It gives you the, oh yeah, no, I know, I know that's there, because that's part of my main navigation. But it also gives you, what? page is that? Where did that come from? Right? Like, who manages that page? I have, like, right? And, and, and so it gives you this list of, of URLs that you can use as part of your ROT process to hopefully weed out all your redundant stuff or all the old stuff that nobody ever looks like or stuff that should never have been published in the first place because we know that happens, right? So now you've got the list of URLs and you're thinking, okay, well, I'm not going to get the content out of this stuff. And let's be clear about content here. Content isn't just the words on the page, right? We know this. We're we're the way. Uh, it's you know if, if you're trying to get this into field of data, you've got you've got uh, titles, you've got PDF files, you've got images, you've got uh, other forms of media, you've got metadata, right? That you're trying to extract. And more importantly, if you're trying to build an accessible website, which I know you all are, right? Because of many reasons not including legislation, um, you're trying to get at alt text, right? Which is, if you were to just cut and paste that stuff, you wouldn't necessarily get uh, the alt text. And so there's a big challenge of trying to do this. And if you think about how to do this, how to get all that, that, uh, that content, it's a big challenge. Because sometimes you're only presented with what's been, um, what's been what's in the DOM, right? What's been, what's been rendered onto your, onto your browser. Um, there are other tools to do this, right? Um, Drupal provides some export capabilities. So if you're going from a Drupal 7 to a Drupal 8, for example, you can use Node Export. But Node Export doesn't act necessarily capture everything, right? You might just capture the title and the body. What about that weird footer block that you got in there? What about this weird block on the side that you're using for your, your social media or your, you know, your links to related content? It might not pull that stuff out. And so your best bet 
is to get at what is rendered on the page so that you can get that out into a database and into a place where you can then harvest it, right? So there's a couple of tools, again, like Cheerio, Node.js. I just wanted to bring those up because those are open source tools that you can use to go and harvest some of these pages based on CSS selectors. And um, so yeah, so you gather, uh, you gathered all your content, right? So it's sitting in a database somewhere, and you're like, fantastic, I've got all my content, I've got all my titles, I've got all my bodies, I've got all my weird stuff that's in the footer and stuff. Uh, great, how am I gonna move this into Drupal? Into my great, wonderful Drupal platform. Well, uh, Drupal uh, has this great tool called Migrate. And Drupal Migrate is uh, amazing right? because it does a lot of things that you would have to do manually. So, so if, you, if you look at this list of things, and the last one is really the most interesting one, uh, these are all the things that you've somehow got to do manually or if you're going to do it manually, right? So you got to go, you got to copy and paste the text, you got to download the images, you got to figure out all the alt text. But the biggest thing there is internal links, right? So you've got all these links that link to somewhere, some other page on your website. And you're trying to figure out, okay, well, my new website, its structure, its path structure is completely different. Imagine the amount of effort that you've got to go to to find all the target pages and then go and change all your content to make sure that you don't have any 404s. That is a monumental task. And Migrate does this for you, right? So Migrate goes, it finds all those paths, it finds all the target paths, and it changes them all for you because it has the UUID, I'm not quite sure, it uses tokens, but, uh, but it'll change it all for you. So you don't have to go and find those individual pages, look into all of your content, and then change all that content. Um, and if you think about it, Robin's gonna talk a little bit about how much time that takes, but it is a monumental task. If you were to give uh, a student or someone this task of migrating all this content, it's incredible. Right, so great. So Migrate has done this for you, right? And uh, now you gotta put it somewhere, right? So what do you, what do, you do with this thing? Um, so you've rolled this content somewhere, hopefully in the cloud, but some, maybe it's on your desktop. Uh, and what's great about Migrate is that it allows you, it gives you the tools to be able to roll stuff in and roll stuff out, right? So you've rolled in all your content. Let's take it, for example, that news content type, right? News content that we all understand what news looks like. It's got a title, it's got a body, it's got a published date. It's got an author, probably. Um, and you realize that your news has a very special field. It's called uh, the Deputy Minister's Office or something like that. And you realize, hey, you know what? That's a field that I can really use because then I can then filter my news by the name of the person that is the Deputy Minister for which this is the news. And what you can do is you can do a bit of content architecture at this point. So what you can, you can do is you can look at your content type and you say, you know what? I really need this extra field, this Deputy Minister field. You can add that field roll the data out, create some new selectors to be able to capture that deputy minister name, and then stick it in the field. And all of a sudden, your data, your content is structured, and it has extra fields that allow you to filter stuff, that allow you to display stuff, to view stuff, so you can get a landing page just for that deputy minister. You can create a view that is just that deputy minister's news. And furthermore, this helps with getting this data out. So if you've got, I don't know, I'm, I'm making stuff up here, but if uh, you know a deputy minister or a minister has a uh, has an Alexa app, let's say, I don't know, uh, you could pull that content out just for that minister, right? Um, and so it gives you a way. You know, content architecture isn't talked about enough, but it gives you a way to really, really structure your data in such a way as to be able to get it out and use all of the tools that are available to you in Drupal to make that data available to outside services. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah, I talked about outside services and mobile and open data. Okay. Um, yeah, so the last bit. So launching this thing, right? So you've got this great Drupal website, great content architecture. It's got all of your content migrated over to it. Including, including all the images, all the metadata, all the alt text that you need for that. And it's sitting over here in your little Drupal instance that's either running on your desktop, hopefully not, 
probably on a on a server somewhere. Let's get you know, and uh, you're like, great, here you go. You shove it over to the, those cloud guys, and they're gonna put it somewhere for you. Well, it's not quite that simple, right? So, so um, you've got to do a bunch of other things to make sure that those pages look correct, right? So you got to do review. You got to you know, you got to check the accessibility, and hopefully, hopefully, if you use Drupal Web, the majority of that content that's been migrated across will be accessible. But there's always going to be exceptions, right? Depending on the source content and, and, uh, and other, other reasons. But there are things that you're going to have to do before you shove it over to those cloud guys and ask them to put it up for you. And so, and you know, you, there are many tools that you can use to do this, right? So we talked about accessibility and, the, and your need to make sure that every single one of those pages is accessible. There's open source tools to do that. We, uh, you know, when I previously worked at the University of Ottawa, we used Site Group, which is a which is a licensed product to be able to do that for you. But Google makes Lighthouse available to you for free. So I, I don't know if anyone, did anyone ever heard of Lighthouse? Google Lighthouse? Yes? Very good. Okay. So this is a tool that's available to you for free. Are you all, you Ottawa guys are laughing because you have site improved. Uh, but Google Lighthouse is free. And there's no reason why you shouldn't use it, especially from a legislative perspective where you need to make sure that your websites meet those accessibility uh, guidelines, right? So there, um, so there are a lot of tools that are available to you in the cloud that are free, that are open, I don't know if they're open source, but they're free and they're free, freely available to you to make sure that your content and your websites meet all of the guidelines that you need to from a TBS perspective. Okay. Uh, you, I think you've already had your high carb treat. Yeah, you have these cookies with your sugar and butter. A bit of flour. Um, okay, so I think you're up. So Robin's going to talk to you. Oh, yeah, we're just going to go through this again. You guys know what that is. But what Robin's going to show you is, you know, so I talked to you guys about all of the different little stages of your modernization project, right? And I talked a little bit about some of the tools, some of the open source tools that you can use to automate some of this stuff. Because who wants to do this manually, right? No one wants to do this manually. You want to automate every single step and stage of that modernization project. So Robin's going to show you a little, uh, a little something. He's going to go through some slides and talk about those tools and how they come together to help you do this. Pardon me. You got to flick it to wake everyone up. All right. I have a. Uh few slides here to go through so knowing that through so knowing that many of you here are GC um, although you know a lot of these components may still apply to anyone in public sector but I just wanted to do a little bit of an orientation session around um, WXT with Government of Canada um, there is a draft directive there that they're trying to make sure that people use Drupal WXT if you are in the federal sector versus being a little bit too cowboyish with just vanilla Drupal. So when it comes to directives, a lot of departments still have carte blanche to at least proceed with that. So there is an AEM mindset with, with web renewal, but uh, Drupal wet is still something that the federal government will allow you to proceed to. Um, it isn't perfect that it's a distribution, no doubt, uh, but neither is Drupal uh, and neither are most other tools for that matter. Uh, but it certainly organically improves daily. Uh, there's a lot of government projects that are uh, uptaking right now so we're, you know ourselves are working with uh, CRA to take over some new projects that are sort of beta Canada.ca and we're working on some alpha initiatives with uh, TBS so it's nice to see that a lot of those skill sets will funnel right back into uh, the distribution to make it um, you know that much better um, I think half of my time in the last year has been invested in working with uh, the, the government of Canada with respect to sitting on open source advisory board presenting at the uh, GC Enterprise Architectural Review Board. Uh, we, we've, we've worked uh, in, in preparing some content with the CMS cluster where they presented to 1GC. Uh, so there's there's genuine buy-in with that whole group and that audience at that level for people who, you know, they, they recognize that Drupal is open source and organically uh, as a community fits well into the digital principles that they want to move forward that, that Sang touched on a bit earlier. 
Uh, and of course, it certainly has a proven ability through past initiatives that it's been able to align continuously with Government of Canada. So there are, there are uh, deployments of Drupal Wet like you see on, on CSC, which is still an older looking field that you may, some, some of you call a Wet 3.1, even though it may be running Wet 4, but it's got an older look. And recently I went to a Canada.ca look and there's been a 1.5 directive of that where now you just have a single menu with a drop down. Well, if you've done Drupal wet correctly, you've inherited a lot of those things over the years that you can upgrade to, and it's not all on you to move that yardstick forward. Um, of course, security is a big piece, um, and you know, we, for years or a decade, I guess I should say now, we've been fighting that battle that um, it, it's not just hackers in their basement that write open source code. There's there's critical mass communities and open source and, and, and tools like Drupal. And I think that uh, a lot of governments, and probably ours being one of the later to that game, is understanding that it's actually more secure by nature. So there's a good appreciation for that. But there's a lot of things that have been done behind the scenes with Drupal and the federal government of Canada to make sure that security has been, uh, has been you know, looked at and, and understood. Some of you already know that Open.Canada is running off Drupal WXT. API.Canada.ca is also the front end with uh, Drupal WXT. And with uh, Canada.ca, there's some really nice projects that are taking place. There's a beta initiative that's coming out of CRA that's, that's uh, started with a couple of initiatives. So a lot of what Sang has talked about are tools that, um, you know, over the course of doing projects, we've uh, honed in a lot of those open source tools, Node.js, some harvester tools, and we've started to put some of this together to try to show, okay, well, this is how we would typically use it internally. And we came up with this domain that you know, was available called GC Cloud. But when we look at people having to build content, if you manually build a piece of content and there's images and you upload your image and you have to do some tagging and you have to translate it and you have to walk through it, that can be a 15, 30 minute process per page. So whether you're, you're moving, you know, it's not as simple as a select all copy paste into your other tool. And you know we've had really bad experiences coming with exports out of other platforms, which aren't you know haven't been trustworthy in the past. Um, so when we look at you know the process of going through a page migration, you know something as simple as a thousand pages could take someone close to 14 weeks to move, and nobody wants to sit there and get that job right of just moving over content. So of course there's got to be some automation tools, and there are many tools. Some of you who may be seasoned Drupal developers have either sat in on a lot of great sessions. Myself, I've gone to Drupal GovCon this year, DrupalCon, um, and the migrate uh, sessions are packed to the till. But a lot of it is about migrate, it's not about harvesting. Drupal migrate will only migrate the structured data source that you've given it. So harvesting has always been a bit of a shortfall. Um, so what we've done with this initiative is we've, we've put together this, this, this front end tool that we have. Um, and we'll do a recorded demo because nobody ever wants to launch something live and run it with a you know unquestionable Wi-Fi. But um, well, we essentially launch a fresh Drupal wet site. Even just getting wet fired up from some teams has been difficult. They don't understand Composer or they run into challenges. And we've heard these nightmare stories of people trying to get their provisioning teams to give them a working sandbox. Um, even with some of the bigger departments, that's been a big struggle. So in this demo we're going to show, we're essentially taking 100 URLs that actually come from a, a client project. Um, and there's 56 images, it's sort of spanned through two domains, and in 18 seconds we're going to harvest out that content, and we're actually going to use Drupal's migrate, Drupal's core structure migrate, to put it back in. The beauty of that is that's not proprietary to us. Everyone running a Drupal site has this migrate back, and we're going to show that in a few minutes. But a couple of the nice pieces there of things that, that can be done through whether, you're, whether you invest your own time into dealing with harvesting scripts, right? Like StatsCan has done this with Node.js harvesters and they've, they've migrated content similarly this way and they've contributed to some of, some of the tool sets that are behind this. But we can join French and English correctly. So if you're coming from a static environment or even any other tool that you may be in, let's use AEM for an example, where it's still, let's say, a static piece of environment where there are two you know, orphan pages. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of relating them an ID. So, um, we join them as a true translation as French and English. We'll download and capture all the assets, whether they're images, videos. Uh, we'll cleanse out some inline styles. So we focus on the HTML attributes. A lot of stuff that's been published out there, there's, there's a lot of garbage in the markup. So a lot of times you want to cleanse that out. Um, you can work entirely from Excel. So the first step that, that Sang touched on, as long as you can get a list of here's the stuff I may have to move, 
uh, which again, whether you use this tool or another tool, you've got to get through that process. And there is a post process to update links. So if it knows that these pages have come in originally under this URL and that they've changed, it's a table that it builds to know these URLs, which are now being called in all these other areas, they need to be post updated. That, that, that's a big component, of course. And wherever possible, with images, we're bringing them in true Drupal fashion. So you may have a, a page that calls an image where it's just an absolute or relative path. In this case, it's a true FID, it's a true UUID. So it's coming in as a digital asset management tool. So we take a stupid page for the most part and we make it intelligent. We can extrapolate components, put them in the fields, grab the images, put them in the actual asset tool that's built into Drupal and then relate them properly. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility. I'll show a little bit about how we use CSS selectors to do that. Now, it's a beta tool. It's available now. You can go to gccloud.ca, but it's just a site. There's really nothing there that you can get out of it, shy of if you start using the tool. So what I'll do is just run through this, um, this recorded session here, and I'll walk through it as I, as I explain, because it, 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 it does show you some of the simplicity of you know, what you can expect out of a tool like this. So this is just the basic you know, vanilla site, and it's built on Drupal. So we like to use the term here that we eat our own dog food. So ironically, this is running on Drupal, AW, uh, sorry, on, on AWS in a, in a Canadian region. Um, you know, we're, we're a protected bee vetted partner. It's, in a, uh, it's running on Drupal WXT. So a lot of where it's running shouldn't be a, a, a concern. And a lot of what's in here can be used just to get your data, just to build your experiment. If you've got to go elsewhere and you want to run something on Kubernetes internally on Azure in your department, no problem. Now you've got your data they can do it and, and migrate to your other, other platform once you're ready to go. So if I sign into this environment as an administrator, I can click on uh, migrate projects and you see here there's this sort of notion of cards. Those are all separate projects. So if I create a project, hence for the sake of the demo, we use a, a, a Drupal camp demo initiative. So What's happening right now is this is just a front end to a Drupal wet stack running behind the scenes and it's just using common Drupal WXT multi-site in the background. So what's happening right now is it's actually building out a Drupal wet site for you. So in, in that timeline, and you know, we give you back a username and a password and you've got a Drupal WXT site running and it took about so 17 seconds to, to fire that up. So by clicking on that action, you now land on a, on a vanilla build that we've done some configurations, right? When you first install Drupal WXT, you get the default theme. Here we enable the Canada.ca theme. Um, we may or may not roll in some of the default uh, sample data that comes. There's already a few migrations that are in there. But it's just to show you here, there's no content in this. It's a bare bones uh, uh, Drupal WXT build. So when you go on that card, there's the notion that you can actually run several sets of migrations. So on that project that I created, we come in here and create a, you know, whatever sample XLS. This is actually a list that was provided to us from, from uh, Treasury Board. So there's around 100 or so URLs. If I look at what that sort of looks like, I know it's too small to look at, but it's pretty straightforward. ID, URL, uh, language, and then there's a pattern, whether it's WXT4, or WXT3, or what have you, which isn't doing, really doing anything right now. But the only two things we're focusing on here right now is while well, we're extracting the title, we're taking the H1, and then we're using CSS selectors to sort of hone in on the body, which is great because that gives us flexibilities. We've seen a lot of departments that don't necessarily stick to what should have done, so unfortunately there are variances. Fortunately, we can deal with some of those variances literally by set uh, if need be. So this essentially looks for the main class. We'll go past the H1 and then we'll go down to the date time and grab everything in between and that's sort of your body. So that, that's the overall notion of how you know, Node.js Harvester works. Um, so the first process once you click on that one migration set is you upload a CSV to it. And again, if you're running these tools internally as a Node.js tool, Node.js has a, uh, some harvester capabilities and Node.js even has a crawler. So if, you're, if you've got a development team, these are some of the things that you could potentially do yourself. We just have a front end on it. That's the only difference. Um, so from here, you've given it a CSV and there's sort of three quick, simple steps here that you go through. Evidently, one, you upload your CSV. The middle part is the harvest part. And that's, that's the, the most challenging part. That's where there's a lot of 
a lot of value and effort that's gone into this is where, okay, I've got to run out and home and, and collect this information. So I've clicked harvest. It's actually going through each of those hundred URLs. It's downloading the images. It's actually bringing them in and putting them into the proper uh, areas in Drupal and building a true FID reference to a lot of those pages. So that's how long it took to run those hundred URLs. It's a, it's a real-time video. There's, there's nothing that's been sort of modified out of this. Um, and now that I've got Har Harvest, it's a SQLite database that's sitting in the background and it's got a reference of, of all this content. If I go migrate, this is actually an API, again, eating your own dog food, Drupal 8 wet. It's got an API in the front of it. So this will show me here just sort of a breakdown of, of, of everything that's in the, um, in the harvested content that's ready for migrate. But some of you who, um, who may have, have used uh, migrate in the past may recognize some of these buttons on the bottom. But usually you see those right in Drupal. That's your roll in, roll out, migrate content. But we'll show it on the flip side of this how it looks. So if I click migrate, it's no different than either using a drush command on the actual Drupal site and running my migrate, or whether you use the UI, which we'll show here in a second. But right now it's through this interface, it's sort of doing the equivalent of pushing out that harvested data into that Drupal site that's ready for, for your deployment. So that took about another 17 seconds or so to push out that content. So I think total processing runtime, we've got about 40 seconds or so to have gone through the whole thing. So if I go back to that site that it built out and we just refresh it, you'll see that there's 100 nodes that have come in. We didn't do multilingual, but it's nice that this was not our curated content. This is literally just from the client's list. And if we look at the data set, so that interface here is actually Drupal's migration interface, but our harvester went um, um, and, and grabbed all of these uh, uh, pieces of, of um, uh, uh, migrated harvested data. So you've got media assets, you've got links, you can have blocks, you can have users. These are all uh, separate segments of things that can be migrated and you can execute each one and you can roll them in or roll them out. So what's nice about that is you can have different sets. And this is one of the reasons why you can have uh, different sets of migrations. So you can have two or three different pieces of test data. You can roll in data set one, do some work, roll it back out, have a whole other set of data, roll that in and roll it out. Uh, probably have a couple of minutes here before we get to Q&A, but um, let's take a look at a couple of those pages. The only difference in modifications that we've done to this is we try to track the source URL. So this is just your know, default Drupal WXT, um, but you see we have a source URL on the side here. Um, so we're just tracking sort of a before and after, right? So it's, if you're, be, if you're gonna try to do some experiments or try to improve something evidently, um, or even if it's, if it's for your own bill, it's not a bad thing, it's just adding a fielded piece of content. So here we've got a, a um, um, a page that shows you the interface, and I'm just going to jump here to the actual live view because I noticed I had forgotten to show something. So this is the same thing we were just looking at, but I just wanted to show that, see, this is the inline image, but the data has come through. It's a true FID, and it's a true link, and it's extrapolated the content, and it's in there as Drupal. So if this image was used on seven nodes, it's the same one image. It would know that it's used seven times. You're, you're now in that, that relational environment of Drupal. So if we look at what this page looks like, this is you know, sort of the page and you know, the images have come through, but I'm in the latest Government of Canada look and feel. If I compare it to the originating source URL task, task from the task tray, I mean, it's close. This is from a right, the one Joe was just proceeding, but this could be, a, I think it is, a static or an ASP site. We don't know, we don't care. Whatever source originated content, it doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, I think in the background, we, we, so if we go incognito on that page, the only difference is, of course, the top tabs are gone. So this is what a user would typically see on that page. But most of everything I ran here is all real time. So, you know, we fired up a Drupal website, we harvested out some migrations, we gave it a list of feeds, and, you know, of course, we're, it's sort of our backyard. This is what we do for a living. So I get that we'll be more effective at it. But it's certainly to show that some of these tools, you know, they're getting, uh, they're, they're getting pretty sophisticated here. Um, so, uh, you know, we show a few other pages that I can probably, you know, skip over uh, some of these components, but here's a tabbed interface. So that was the before, 
Um, and we didn't really get to look at any of these, so I was just arbitrarily picking some out of the out of the experience when I looked at it. But the tabs come through and, and, and look fine. Um, so yeah, the, the data was you know comes through pretty cleanly. It's it's not perfect, um, but the way it's been architected, it's pretty flexible. And we've used a lot of methods in the past. We used uh, the feeds approach. We used several other tools, uh, and we found that using that that DOM method with Node.js and Harvester, um, there, there there's literally no restriction. It's it's very very quick, as you saw. So we ran a hundred very quickly. Um, so you can run tens of thousands of pages this way. Um, and the ability to use Drupal's migrate tool is you can roll out, roll in, make adjustments, maybe extend some of the CSS selectors, maybe start biting in chunks into more content type. Uh, approaches, but it'll give you a few options. And what we're showing in the back end here, we're starting to do some more integrations. So we're just showing the the, the interface of if you're, you know, for some of you that you mentioned you've used Lighthouse, um, which isn't perfect, but it's an open source tool. It's 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 uh, from Google and it's it's getting good investments. Um, and out of any site in in Chrome, you can do this, right? You can right click, inspect element, go audit, and it'll give you this same report. Um, but we essentially have a visualizer that's baked in. So it's just a GitHub project that we brought in. So you can take any of your JSON feeds and, and throw them in there to see them yourselves, but you can do this page by page. We're integrating this more where we can so that you can see a page, maybe a before, maybe an after, uh, so that from a URL, you can now see your new harvested page, your previous page, and from those URLs, maybe see the Lighthouse report on both of them. Again, they're, they're not perfect. They can't be replaced with, you know, with, with, with full tools, but they're giving you some interesting pieces of data, sometimes pieces of data that's often too ignored. The sample one that we went there is actually the Canada.ca default one. And it says it does great on accessibility. It doesn't do really good on performance. So there's always reasoning behind some of that. But again, it's giving you insight. Um, you know, from with respect to the to that presentation, I mean that's that's sort of the bulk of, of what we had, and we wanted to then leave some time for some some Q and A's here. We're going on the forty five mark, um, so that's it. Anybody have any questions? We want to make sure we cover off here a few minutes. If uh, everybody's going to jump on Drupal with it, yes. Yes, we were even looking at a CLF2. Believe it or not, we found five or six of those laying around and just for shits and giggles, we essentially tried out a few of those. And the CSS selectors are a little bit different. So the two big ones that we saw that were different is main is not there, but that's just a different class that we were used. I think it was w, wb cont and the date and the bottom was a little bit different. But you just give it your start and start and stop start and stop area of where your body sort of is, and you can sort of fetch out anything. But we've done wet three, we play with CLF two. You know, it's harder to get the whole menu to come through, but a lot of times you may want to rebuild that anyhow. Um, but it's it's very versatile, and even though we're showing this that it's you know we're tailoring it a little bit maybe more for federal government, it applies to to anything. A lot of people use these tools for whatever reason. So how do you share those different? Well, what we're, unfortunately, that's the part that, you know, the reality is that it's not always perfect. Even in one site, same URL, even clicking on news bulletins, we can see just through clicking through in the patterns that there's been three or four evolutions of tools because the markup's different. You're, you've lost your pattern halfway through. But that's all right. It just means that you have to maybe run two sets or three sets. Some places are really good at saying, well, let's just go fresh. It's not, you know, let's grab the last two years. We're fine. Some places want to go the whole last seven years of all of their news archives. And then we've noticed some people will do things like, oh, we, we've got events. And then you think you're hooked onto a pattern and whoops, they don't even have dates on their events or don't have locations. And then you, you lose out for a few pieces. But again, there's some nimbleness tied into the methodology on how you're dealing with, you know, as a URL, as, as, a, as an Excel standpoint, you can push through some of that. Uh, or maybe ignore it or do hybrids of, uh, of tiers. So in your content architecture, you can try to deal with the flexibility that even in something that you think would be a, an easy straight up content type, there may be two or three editions of it. And I, I, the other thing I might add is that your content architecture will dictate some of this mapping. Right? So if you, if you come up with a content architecture 
architecture for your particular site where you know that for an event content type, uh, you definitely are going to use Minister, your your migrate is going to be a little bit different because it's got to be able, to, your harvest is going to be able to pull out that Minister's name, you've got to store that separately, and then your migrate has to know to move that Minister's name into this particular field. So, Right? It's not like a single solution that will work for everyone. But it's a frame, it's an open source framework built on Drupal that anyone can use to, to help automate your web modernization project. That's there's there's one last thing there that's that's interesting is you can still bulk migrate what looks like an event and keep it a static page. At least it allows you to bring in your volume. And when it comes time to either adjust that page or then you're investing the time into it. If you're dealing with high volume, you can't be expected to hand touch maybe you know 30,000 pages. So at least this helps deal with, okay, we know that under this set of patterns, we can bring in 80% of that content. Well, that you're 80% ahead of that curve. And if there are pages that you do need to modify, you can go and edit those pages and then use better Drupal architecture. Maybe you're using paragraphs, maybe you're using HTML templates to just rebuild that page. Uh, but maybe you're leaving some of the older stuff a little bit alone. The URL will work, the links to it will work, and that's fine for now. So it buys you time, buys you runway. Good question. Anything else? How does Harvest and Google Translation set the tone? So there's two methods that we've played with. One, again, if we know we're in Government of Canada and we know that people have done their jobs correctly, we know that the language switcher is supposed to take you to the exact same page, right? Okay, so that was one of the methods that we use. We just always look up for the markup, always look for language switcher, toggle it, and then we can, we know we're at the French equivalent, and then we harvest that out, and then we make it.